Good afternoon, everybody. I know I'm tardy to the party, but um, I just want to thank you guys for coming out. Uh, we have a spectacular uh, speaker here this evening, uh, this afternoon, uh, Ms. Christine Clark. Um, I had an opportunity to meet her at Senator Peralta's Black History Month ceremony. Um, and without hesitation, when I asked her to come to Toro, she said yes. I don't think she understood how far it was, but I'm glad she's here. Um, Ms. Clark has a wealth of knowledge and experience, um, some of which uh, we are all interested in, and that's civil rights. And that is, most importantly, her work that she's been able to do with the Legal Defense Fund, with the NAACP. We all strive towards a more just society, uh, and we know that with great leadership and people who are advocating, we will be able to change the tides of humanity for all of us. We came to school with a purpose, and that is to help represent the less fortunate among us. And that is what we seek to do when we get our degrees. Ms. Clark uh, is currently the chief of the Civil Rights Division at the Attorney General's office. She's gonna to speak to you guys briefly about issues in the 21st century that we all can be a part of that can help change the world. I just wanna take this time to introduce Ms. Christine Clark. Good afternoon. Um, I wanna first start off by thanking Mr. Gavins for the very kind invitation to join you all today. And no, I did not realize how far the law school was from New York. Um, I send you greetings on behalf of Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. And I um, also wanna just take a moment to recognize Travis Nemhard, who's a volunteer attorney um, in our office, uh, fresh out of law school. I encourage all of you to think about careers in public interests and careers in the government and to think about uh, working and serving in our office. Um, our attorney general actually is over at New York University Law School right now where he just made a really big and exciting announcement today about work that we've been doing with, ma uh, with Major League Soccer uh, to help strengthen their efforts to combat discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. We've been doing similar work with the NFL and with Major League Baseball, and we're really excited about the transformative impact that we're having on the world of Major League Sports, getting them to step up their efforts to ensure that nobody uh, faces discrimination on the basis of their LGBT status. And we're very excited about the recent and historic developments uh, that we have seen with the announcements from Jason Collins and Michael Sam. All right. so. It is especially great to be with you today uh, because of the particular historical moment that we're in. As many of you know, um, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and this May marks the 60th anniversary of the Supreme Court's historic ruling in Brown versus Board of Education. So what I thought I would do today is take some time focusing my remarks on the goals that remain unfulfilled in the wake of Brown versus Board of Ed. This is uh, an intensely important question for all of us, for all of you as law students. Um, in many respects, we've seen a lot of gains since Brown over the last six decades, but we know that those gains are fragile and that there are still very significant challenges that we face in the field of education. Um, last month, many of you may have uh, uh, followed President Barack Obama's historic announcement, um, the launch of his My Brother's Keeper initiative, a White House initiative that's designed to expand opportunity uh, and success for young men and boys of color. I was very encouraged and heartened to see the president underscoring the challenges that uh, young boys of color face today. And one of the greatest areas where we see a lot of these challenges when it comes to education uh, is with respect to the school to prison pipeline. How many of you guys know a little bit about the school to prison pipeline problem? I see one hand. Um, so let me 
let me give you some context. In the spring of 2010, up in Buffalo, a young 15-year-old boy named Jawan Daniels, he was a freshman at Lafayette High School in the city of Buffalo, was roaming the hallways of his school. And for roaming the hallways, Jawan was suspended. He was suspended immediately and asked to exit the school. And as Jawan was sitting uh, at the, at the uh, bus stop, waiting for the bus to go home, he was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting. So for roaming the halls, Jawan lost his life. At the time of this very tragic incident, one out of every five students in the city of Buffalo uh, were suspended each year, compared to a statewide average that we have in New York of one in every 20 students. Um, suspensions in the city disproportionately impacted African American and Hispanic students, and Buffalo sadly is not uh, an isolated scenario. Zero tolerance policies that we see today all across New York and all across the country originate out of a law that was passed by Congress called the Gun Free Schools Act, uh, which was passed in the wake of horrendous acts of violence at public schools, the Columbine shooting, for example. When, while the act was passed to deal with the specific problems of weapons possessions in schools, districts have used this law to dramatically expand the range of offenses that can lead to automatic suspensions today. So in many districts, students now face automatic suspensions for minor disruptive behavior and tardiness. So we've seen categories like weapons and drugs uh, now be expanded to include things like nail files and aspirin. Uh, another example of the problem we see comes out of Virginia, where a 13-year-old girl was recently barred from coming to school for several weeks and required to attend disciplinary hearings and eventually transferred school because she brought acne medication uh, with her to school in violation of a policy that requires that medication be checked in at the school clinic and signed by a parent. Zero tolerance. The US Department of Education Office of Civil Rights reports that currently more than three million students in our country are suspended at least once every year, and more than 100,000 are expelled. And these rates have doubled since the 1970s as a result of the zero tolerance policies that we see across our school system. The impact on students of color and students with disabilities has been particularly pernicious. The percentage of black students suspended in secondary schools at least once in a given year moved from 11.8% in 1973 to 24% uh, in 2009. The percentage of students with disabilities who were suspended over that time moved from 6.6% .6 up to 19.3%. And fully, 36% of black male school student, uh, uh, black middle school students with disabilities were suspended at least once across the nation. So what is the impact of this on our kids, on students? Diminished performance because of minimized class time. Uh, this increases the chance that students will drop out. Research shows that being suspended even once in ninth grade is associated with a two-fold increase in that child dropping out of school and increases the likelihood that these students will move into the criminal justice system. Uh, research shows that two-thirds of ninth graders who are arrested at least once uh, were also suspended at least once prior to that in eighth grade. This is the school to prison pipeline that we're talking about. So what are the justifications that people talk about uh, for zero tolerance and what are the alternatives? For one, there's a wide range of strategies that educators talk about that can help improve child performance uh, and move us away from this zero tolerance approach to, um, uh, uh, to bad behavior. Restorative justice principles involve engaging in collaborative problem solving enhancing personal responsibility, empowering change and growth in kids, uh, strategic plans for restoration and reparation. And there's proof that these strategies work. 
there's evidence that shows that these principles help drive down misconduct, drive down rates of suspensions and referrals while increasing student performance. In Minneapolis, these principles were used at two schools and increased academic achievement and re reduced suspension by a rate of 63%. And in Denver, they put these principles to work and decreased out of school suspensions by 40%. In Chicago, where the number of out-of-school suspensions quadrupled to over 93% between 2001 and 2007, the implementation of restorative justice practices saved 1,000 days of suspensions. Had Jawan Daniels been in school that day and not suspended for roaming the halls, he might still be alive today. And the one positive thing that came out of his tragic death was that it prompted reform in Buffalo. It prompted the school board and the school superintendent to take a step back and question, what are we doing? Last spring, a coalition of parents and community advocates successfully pushed the Buffalo Board of Education to pass a new con uh, code of conduct based on some of the restorative justice principles that I just spoke about. And they passed that code of conduct in Juwan's name. Every child in our state deserves access to equal educational opportunity. And when we're pushing kids out, um, that's grave cause for concern. I want to turn now to a, uh, another big problem that we face today when it comes to education. And that is with the increasing attacks that we are seeing on affirmative action. Some of you may have followed a very important case that went before the Supreme Court about a year, year and a half ago called the Fisher versus University of Texas case. How many of you are familiar with that case? Okay, I see a few more hands. This case involved a constitutional challenge to the University of Texas's college admissions policy. And our office led a bipartisan effort among states to file a brief on the right side of this case arguing about the continuing importance and need for diversities in our colleges and our university classrooms. Let me take a moment to talk about the policy that was at issue in this case. The University of Texas uses a two-part um, admissions policy. Most students are admitted into the UT system through what's called the top 10% plan. Basically, if you live in Texas and you are among the top 10% of performers in your high school class, you're guaranteed a seat in the UT system. And sadly, because Texas is such a segregated place, it's resulted in some level of diversity in the UT system. But for the remaining seats that are not filled through the top 10% plan, the university uses a holistic whole review of application um, process. And this process allows the school to um, look at a range of factors, including um, an applicant's um, uh, essay, uh, their leadership qualities, the extracurricular activities they were involved with, awards they may um, have received throughout the years, their work experience, community service, Fam uh, familial responsibilities that they carry, um, their socioeconomic status, languages that they may speak at home, and race. So race is one among many factors used to conduct this holistic review of applications for just a few slots that remain, uh, that are not filled through the temp top 10% plan. It is this marginal, narrow, careful, consideration of race that was at issue um, in the Fisher case. Um, there were a range of amicus briefs beyond the one that we filed um, that went before the court that talked about diversity and its significance. And I want to highlight just a few of the findings from those briefs for you. Uh, there was a, a brief that was submitted by 50 Fortune 100 companies that I thought was very compelling that explained that diverse universities and workplaces are crucial to America's business success in a diverse global marketplace. Americans who are educated in diverse settings, the brief noted, have an increased ability to facilitate unique and creative approaches to problem solving at work by integrating different perspectives, moving beyond conventional thinking. Uh, a diverse workplace helps ensure 
uh, that businesses are able to employ a wide and meet a wide variety of consumer needs um, and ensure that businesses are able to work productively with business partners, employees, and clients in the U.S. and around the world. So these are Fortune 500 companies saying diversity matters and makes a difference. The military uh, submitted a brief that I thought was very interesting and essentially told the story about the evolution of diversity in the military across the years and what it's meant for how our military operates. In 1962, a mere 1 1.6% of our military was comprised of African Americans. That's a very tiny number. Um, in 1969 and 1970 alone, the Army documented more than 300 race-related internal disturbances which resulted in the deaths of 71 American troops. And by the 1970s, racial tension had ran so high within the armed forces that they described the situation as teetering on the verge of self-destruction. Um, these problems, which resulted from the lack of diversity in the military, created integrity concerns and performance issues due to the fact that service members' visions of what it, uh, was possible for their career uh, was sh were shaped by individuals with similar backgrounds excelling and being recognized in their service. The military learned that through trial and error, diversity really mattered. And today, the military has moved from pl a place where blacks comprise a mere 1.6% of the ranks to a place where today they now make up 34% of the Naval Academy's incoming class. 27% of the Air Force Academy's incoming class, and 27% of the West Point's, uh, West Point's incoming class. Uh, in the military's view, diversity has increased the likelihood that the military knows the enemy and is better able to work with international part partners by adding to the cultural and li linguistic knowledge base upon uh, which the U.S. forces depend. Social science researchers submitted a brief observing that uh, the tremendous research which shows that the level of diversity on a university's campus can affect the institution's retention rate for minority students and improve gradua graduation rates. And the NAACP Legal Defense Fund filed a brief noting that diversity helps to break down racial stereotypes, enabling students to better understand one another. Um, they observed that um, underrepresented minorities may not feel comfortable expressing their individ individuality when relegated to a token status, and that diversity reduces the likelihood that minorities feel isolated or compelled to conform to a forced social script. That non-minority students learn that there is no such thing as a minority uh, view, uh, point of view and instead learn that there are a variety of viewpoints among minority students. Diversity, all of these briefs illustrate, is a healthy thing for the learning environment. So school to prison pipeline attacks on affirmative action, real pressing problems that we face today and need to be focused on. I thought I would close out my speech by talking about some of the work that we're doing beyond education in our office. And then I look forward to having an exchange with you and hearing about uh, some of your views uh, and some of the priorities that you observe today as, as pressing in the civil, uh, civil rights for, uh, space. As the chief law enforcement agency for the state of New York, our office is really proud to be on the front lines combating discrimination and working to promote justice and equality. Um, in every major civil rights case that has gone before the Supreme Court in recent years, beyond the Fisher case that I mentioned, we have been standing up and presenting the uh, views of states uh, in these incredibly important high-stakes matters. We stood up in defense of the Voting Rights Act, which came under attack about a year ago. Uh, we have uh, worked to defend diversity in college, colleges and universities, as I've already noted, and we've been standing up for marriage equality as well. Um, outside of the court, we're on the front lines working to combat discrimination wherever it rears its ugly head. 
um, to close many of the wealth gaps that we know we face today along racial lines. We're working to combat discrimination in the job market and working to ensure equal access to uh, employment opportunities for all. We recently secured uh, an agreement with a Fortune 500 employment homelessness and mass incarceration that too many of our communities continue to wrestle with. We are inspired by the possibility that through aggressive and tireless civil rights enforcement and collective action, we might together close some of the gaps that persist today. To that end, I want to encourage all of you to consider careers in the public, uh, public interest. As you contemplate your next steps, um, be mindful of the impact that you can have doing this work. Be mindful of the tremendous needs that we still face as a state, as a nation. Be mindful of the work that remains unfinished. Be mindful of the need to combat the discrimination that stands as a threat to the real fragile gains that we have, uh, we have made. Be mindful of the need to fight for equality and the need to make our democracy more whole. Um, to make meaningful and lasting change it requires that we all play a part. And I look forward to uh, remaining in touch with you, um, particularly those of you who may be interested in pursuing careers uh, in public interest. And I will, I will stop there, Antoine, so that we maybe can take some questions from folks. Does the microphone sit? Anyone have any questions specifically of civil rights. Hi, I, I've been uh, doing some research uh, with one of the professors over here at the school um, who's interested in civil rights issues. And some of the numbers I got uh, for New York State are uh, really interesting. Um, for instance, 44% uh, of um, New York City um, is a uh, white population, 25.5% are black, yet um, 121,000 arrests were made for whites and 178,000 made for blacks. And the conviction rate, there were 63.9 uh, um, thousand convictions for whites and 98.5 thousand for blacks, and that was just last year. I was wondering what steps your office is making to try to uh, renegotiate that landscape and, and try to equal it out. Uh, and another uh, thing I wanted to bring up is, I know that 97% of the uh, drug arrests, marijuana arrests, are in uh, New York City. And um, since uh, a disparate um, number of those arrests are minorities, uh, what steps are is the, your office doing on that regard? And my last thing is, uh, for when I was doing this research, it was very difficult to find information about Hispanics because they're categorized as Hispanics, non-white, and then Hispanics, white included. I was wondering if there was um, any steps by your office, to, or if there are any steps by your office to kind of clarify that number so we can also see for Hispanics what, uh, to clarify the numbers for Hispanics. Yeah, those are all um, great questions and great data. Um, I want to make sure that I get you a copy of the report that we issued on the NYPD stop and frisk program. We look very carefully at the impact of stop and frisk, not only with respect to blacks, but also with respect to Latinos of any race. We looked at them as a singular category, and we found that these disparities that I noted held true for both blacks and Latinos that the um, arrest of Latinos also resulted in similar dismissal rates, and the conviction rate, the very tiny conviction rates that I noted also held true um, with respect to those Hispanics who, also, who were also subject to stop and frisk. So I wanna make sure that we get you a copy of the report so that you can look at it. With respect to drug arrests, we, um, we, we found something that quite interesting. We found that for um, blacks and Latinos who um, were stopped and frisked and arrested for marijuana pos possession. Um, that if, if you were white, you had twice, uh, you were um, twice as likely to be given what's called an ACD, an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, 
which essentially means that um, unless you screw up over a six month a period, that arrest record will be closed, dismissed, it will be as if it never um, occurred, it won't be on your record. So if you, you were black or Latino, stopped and frisked and uh, arrested for marijuana, um, you were you know, far less likely to be offered the opportunity to get rid of that, uh, dispose of that arrest by way of ACD. So there were some disparities that we observed and we looked at some of the data at a very granular level and I wanna make sure they get, get you a copy of that report. But great question. Uh, Ms. Clark, we have a lot of 1Ls in our audience who are now currently looking for summer employment. And a lot of reasons why 1Ls are deterred from working in public interest is because a lot of the times they're unpaid. What can they do to defray the cost of education when there are unpaid internships? And um, do you have any recommendations going forward um, if they decide to pursue a career in public interest? That's a great question. Um, so. When I applied to law school, I applied to law school because I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. I wanted to do good work, public interest work, and um, it definitely is not a lucrative path. Um, we definitely don't do this work for the money. And um, I started off my career at the Justice Department in the Civil Rights Division. I turned down a job at a law firm that probably would have paid four or five times as much as what I got paid as a, a lawyer at DOJ, but um, about a month into the job, I was on the, uh, on the road in the Deep South doing work that I think is pretty darn righteous. Um, we, you know, you definitely don't go down this path for the money. That said, I sure hope that um, your law school, and if they don't, maybe you can mobilize and press uh, for as much will offer support for those of you who are interested in um, pursuing summer internships in, um, uh, in the public interest. Um, offer support for those who want some loan repayment support when you graduate so that you can try and make ends meet to do, do this good work. Um, when I was graduating from uh, law school, I went to Columbia, they had a, a, a pretty generous loan repayment program. Um, and they also offered 20, I think it was 2000 to $2,500 stipends over the summer so that you can do public interest work. And I'm gonna gather from your question that they don't offer that here. No? Okay. Fantastic. Even more generous. So we need to make sure that everybody knows about all of the great opportunities that are available here. Hello. Um, I was wondering, well, with the new bar requirement, we have to do 50 hours of pro bono work. And I want to know what opportunities does your agency offer for us to get involved and at least do something that we feel that could help the community or help uh, minorities as a whole and contribute towards our pro bono hours. That's great, that's a great question. Um, we take interns throughout the year. I mean, if any of you are interested in serving as an intern in our office in the fall of uh, next year, in the spring of next year, for the remainder of this semester uh, or the summer, just uh, give me a call and let me know. I have a bunch of business cards that I'm gonna leave with you. And let me, um, if you don't mind, put Travis on the spot so he can talk a little bit about his experience serving as a volunteer attorney in our office. Um, he's not, uh, some chuckle. Um, we, we have a number of you know recent grads who have spent some time with us, folks who may not have yet secured uh, full-time permanent employment, but who spend some time with us and get the chance to do really great work, get the time to do depositions, develop cases, settle cases, as Travis has, and can now go out and really market themselves to secure and land that full-time position that they want. So Travis, why don't you say a word or two about your experience? Uh, can you hear me? All right, um, so as Kristen said, uh, um, it's been a great opportunity so far. Um, I've had an opportunity to, uh, like she said, settle cases, uh, draft settlement agreements, um, uh, anything from uh, doing subpoena hearings um, myself, you know. Uh, it was, it's been a great, great opportunity. A lot of my colleagues uh, that are at 
um, law firms, they they enjoy their experience as well. But when we were talking about the different things we do, you know, they were really shocked at the fact that I was doing all of these things because um, generally at law firms it takes maybe three, maybe uh, three or uh, three at the least amount of years before you're doing anything besides researching and maybe drafting up a memo. You know, so. Um, it's been it's been a really great experience um, and a, and a great opportunity to learn from it. And um, if I w could do it again, I would do it again um, because um, this experience has been very invaluable. Hi, uh, thanks for coming to the school. I just had a general question. I know you said that you guys offer uh, internships throughout the year. Um, obviously, as you can tell, this our school is pretty minute compared to the other schools in the city, the big schools in the city. As you said, uh, Eric is at New York Law. Um, in terms, in terms of one else ourselves getting uh, internships at you know at your agency, um, is there really a disparity as far as the school that you guys evaluate, or the, is purely candidate base? Purely candidate base. Absolutely not. We do not believe in elitism. Um, we have candidates that have come from all kinds of law schools all across the, uh, all across New York State, and I would love to encourage you, all of you, um, to apply and work in our office. Uh, great question, but absolutely not. Yeah. We'll take one last question. Anyone else? Uh, I'll just ask the last question then. Uh, and in terms of uh, a, st a shopping frisk, how is it that a, such a program like that has been able to fly under the fray for so long, and now, uh, I'm not asking for reparations or anything, but uh, now there's a, a theme of social justice going on. Uh, could you just speak to what the AG's office is doing and how we're going to begin to stop such programs that continue to discriminate? Uh, and the last part that's not related, some believe that the LSAT, LSAT is a, a deterrent to getting minorities into law school. And I don't know if you guys have studied that also, but maybe you can speak of that also. Yeah, that's a that's a three-part question there. So, um, so shop in, our shop in for, uh, investigations are ongoing, so I can't talk about them. But what I can say is that you know all of these cases, no colored nurses, shop and frisk. Um, the tool that we use often to investigate and develop these cases is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it is truly remarkable that here we stand 50 years out and find ourselves still in need of the important protections and strong medicine that our federal civil rights laws from 50 years ago still provide. You know, we, we still need these laws today now more than ever. And so I, to me, that is the real takeaway from the work that, that we are doing. You know, where, where the struggle is not over. We are not post-racial. We're not over the problems of race. We have indeed made real and very significant and encouraging progress, but we shouldn't be blinded by it. And we've got to remember that those gains are fragile. And the moment you blink uh, is when, um, uh, you know, when there's a problem. So we're still rolling up our sleeves and fighting uh, because we realize that the problems are, problems are real. Um, the LSAT, I think that's a great question. And there was a great um, article in the New York Times that talked about the SAT and how people are taking a step back and questioning how we um, you know, assess one's ability to perform and likelihood of um, su success in schools. How do we gauge um, you know, performance and whether we move away from these high stakes tests, right, where we're putting so much stock in how one uh, performs on a test and whether this has become a, a game of simply figuring out who can afford the prep, you know, the prep courses that it takes to for perform well on these tests. So I'm glad that there are people who are, you know, taking a step back and looking more critically at high stakes exams, whether it's SATs, LSATs. In New York City, um, under Mayor, former Mayor Bloomberg, a lot of the seats for the gifted and talented program in elementary schools, um, it, it, that, that the process for allotting those seats was dramatically reformed under Mayor Bloomberg. We moved to a system of, of high stakes tests. If you want a seat in a gifted and talented school in New York City under Mayor Bloomberg, um, 
they, they changed the rules so it came down to just how you performed on this one test. And as a result, we saw less diversity in gifted and talented programs. So um, a, it's a great question, an area that we, uh, we definitely got to focus on and I think ties back nicely to a point that I uh, brought up earlier in my presentation. The importance of diversity in uh, the education space. And the University of Texas, I think, found a really creative way to try and achieve diversity. And that battle is not over. So we got to make sure that we keep our eyes on the Fisher case to kind of see what, what comes of this encroaching threat on race conscious admissions policies in the higher ed context. Thank you.